can tell you a few things without violating my non-disclosure agreement. Number one, it's not going to be on discovery. Uh, number two, I can't tell you the name. Number three, no, I can't tell you. The, <laughs> um, I will. I will share some some things about it with you, uh, maybe towards the end of the talk. And um, I, I had hoped to share some video with you, but. It's not yet ready. It's in post-production right now. There are 10 episodes, and it will be available for viewing in the fall. And that's about it. And, and I can't tell you exactly what it is, uh, but it's, it's mostly me and Tori and Carrie doing a lot of the same things that we used to do on Mythbusters. It's going to look a lot different, and they're not really myths that we are busting, if that makes any sense at all. But uh, I will, as soon as I am able, announce it, and, and you'll, I'm sure you'll be able to view it wherever you are. So um, let's go ahead and take some questions. If you have any questions for me, uh, you can, I think there's a microphone here, at least. Um, come right up and ask a question, and I will be happy to answer it for you. Yes. Uh, hello, Mr. Imahara. Uh, Imahara, sorry. No worries. Grant. <laughs> okay. You can call me Grant. Um, I was uh, wondering, in in the when you were testing the myth mythical ways of beating lie detectors. Yes. Uh, one of the cruxes of the, your testing was, in addition to committing a quote-unquote crime, there was a reward and a punishment. Oh yeah. The show was really good about implying that the punishments happened. I think they showed clips or showed yeah. like uh, Tor uh, Tori and Carrie getting on a bus back to San Francisco. Yeah. But uh, it wasn't as clear about the rewards. So okay. I was just wondering, um, were, did the, were the rewards given? Did uh, Carrie manage to get a flight first class? And more importantly, for beating that um, MRI machine that you were hooked up to, did you get $1,000? I will, I will tell you the whole story behind that one. So this episode was about beating the lie detector. It's not just a regular polygraph machine. This is an fMRI, functional MRI. So you sit in an MRI machine, and they scan your brain for certain patterns, which correspond to either telling the truth or lying. And it's, it's a similar thing to the polygraph, where they say, and, and the, the thing that we were supposed to do was take a ring out of a box or not take a ring. And so they ask you questions over and over again. Did you take the ring? Was the ring taken? Had the ring been taken from the box? Is the ring still in the box? And various uh, variations of that in order to get you to, to slip up. Now, of course, this is for science. And so the thing about this particular technology, which they're trying to to develop in order to really interrogate people is that the lie has to be something based on high stakes, high risk, high reward. The reward was, I think it was a thousand dollars cash if you beat the lie detector. The risk is that you travel home on a bus. Now again, this is, this is for science, and our producers are real sticklers about carrying through with this. So in order to fool us into what was going to happen, our producer printed out, it, this is not an actual bus ticket, what she did was, it was really clever, she went to the Am, uh, Greyhound website printed out just the schedule of where you would go. And we were far away. We were at, um, I forget if we were in Kentucky or something like that. It was far. It was like a multi-day trip. She printed out the whole schedule and put it, and she, they went to the bus station and got one of those ticket folders, like the, the jacket, put that inside of the jacket. So we do the test, and... I managed to beat the machine just by, by, yeah, I know. Apparently I'm a very good liar, or I can fool myself into thinking something, enough so that I can beat the machines. 
which could come in handy in future uh, in the future. <laughs> so I beat the lie detector, and Carrie and Tori didn't. And all the way up until the very end of filming, like she gave Carrie, and Carrie was mortified. Tori was okay. Carrie was mortified at sitting on a greyhound for you know, six hours and then another six hours. They gave her this, this fake ticket inside of the, the greyhound jacket. They drove her to the station, and I was also convinced that they were going to at least make her go through with this for a couple stops. I gave, I gave her like 80 bucks cash, right? And I'm like, okay, just take the cash. I'll find a way to get you out. <laughs> and she's like, and, she's, and, and, we, and they're like, okay, um, right. You also have to film this. And so they had her about $1,000 worth of camera equipment in front of everybody waiting for this Greyhound bus. And she starts, as, and, and we're in the, the van driving away, she starts crying. And, and I'm like, are you really going to do this? Are you really going to do this as we're driving away? And they're like, no. And so we drove around the block, and then we came back. They just wanted to get that last piece of it. But. And as for the $1,000, I went to the executive producer, Dan Tapster. I'm like, uh, Dan, <laughs> you made a promise. And, and so in the end, I actually did get the $1,000, which bought me a new MacBook, uh, MacBook Pro. So, but they were serious about that, and up to the last minute, Carrie thought she was going to be riding a Greyhound bus home. <laughs> so, she was, so she was really pissed when she was, like, when she was swearing and refusing to, to it, speak to the camera. It's like, I'm not... Or, oh, no, that's that. all for real. That's all 100% real. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. My question is actually two questions in one. Um, I was wondering how much of the actual background work you guys did, like you guys dropped a piano on a house one time. Yes. And it showed you guys doing uh, the rigging. However, all of the crane operators I know, and I know a lot of them, they won't let anybody that they don't know and trust touch the rigging. And also in, yeah. here in Hawaii, you have to be certified as a rigger. Yes. And then also I was wondering if... Carrie actually did anything, or if she was just eye candy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the beginning, when, when Carrie, and Tori, Carrie and Tori were hired before me as builders, and so from the very beginning, my contract was not for, and, and the same for Carrie and Tori, not for on-air talent. We were hired as builders, and, you know, I come from a special effects back. All of us came from special effects, and we have various skill levels. The original concept for the show was to have people who could think about these things, present them, but also build them and make them happen. My contract said builder. It included a clause for the first at least four years, possibly five, that included taking out the trash, this honest thing, <laughs> from the building. That was, that was how, when we started, that was how, how ghetto we were. Because they didn't want to, you know, the, the whole concept for the show was shot on, on shaky, handy cams, uh, documentary style, really gritty, not polished at all. As... as the show progressed through the years, it got more and more polished. But in the beginning, if you watch early episodes, it's literally shot on Sony Handycams, a bunch of them, and kind of all spliced together. So in the beginning, we didn't have builders. It actually wasn't until Carrie got pregnant and could no longer continue uh, running the table saw and the chop saw that we got builder help. But up until then, 100%. We were all that we had in those days. And it's true, when Carrie started, she, she, wasn't, she didn't know welding, she didn't know carpentry, but by the end, she sure did. And she, she got good at it. <laughs> so 
we did almost all of our own building. And for me, it's, it's sort of a point of pride because a lot of things that I build are, are more technical um, that require machining and things like that. So even before Mythbusters, I was working in special effects for 10 years at Industrial Light and Magic. And so I already had all these skills going in. And they're like, okay, great. You just keep doing what you do and we'll film it. Um, so, yeah. And it's funny with the new show. I'll, I'll tell you about the new show. <laughs> so the new show, uh, same production company. So it's from the producers of Mythbusters. But slightly different management. The new show, they... they, they kind of knew of us, but I think they didn't really believe in our skills as builders. I show up on the first day, uh, and I go up to the drill press, and I'm like, I go to turn it on. It doesn't turn on. It's not even plugged in. I'm like, you guys, if you want me, to, and then I go to the tool chest. Okay, so after Mythbusters started, uh, after the uh, Carrie Tor and I left Mythbusters, they, they shut down M7, right? So all of our tools, I bought the mill, which is great. Because I, I was the only user of that thing for 10 years, so I bought the mill, I've got that in my shop. The rest of the tools, they, they sold off. What they couldn't sell off, they gave away to the staff. And what nobody else wanted, went onto a truck and came down to us for the new show. <laughs> so I've got like, a, you know, only Phillips screwdrivers and, <laughs> you know, three out of 17 Allen wrenches and I'm like, you guys, you have to buy a tool set. This is unacceptable. And every tool in here, that's a, I, for me, it's like every tool in here has to be plugged in and ready to go. The bandsaw has to have a, a saw blade <laughs> when I walk up to it, or else this is not going to work. And so they ended up buying more tools and making sure that everything was plugged in. The other thing is, the concept for the show, they wanted it to look um, like, like Tony Stark's lab, which is great. I, I, love, I love the look of, of that Iron Man uh, Avengers world, of the shield helicarrier. I love that whole thing. The only problem with trying to build things in Tony Stark's lab is you can't see anything. It's dark. <laughs> People who build things need light. And so I'm, I'm, again, at the drill press trying to drill holes. I'm like, I can't see my mark. Can I please have a light on, on the drill press? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. So I promise you the new show is going to be really cool. We are building a whole lot of things. I built a jousting machine Ooh. so <laughs> I know it's I, it's really once you see it it'll all make sense I'm sure but <laughs> at the moment it's gonna be a little weird so um, anyway all that to say yes we did build everything that we worked on we had meetings so and and if you look at the show right the blueprint everybody's like oh your blueprint thing is so fake that's true that is fake <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's a thing that was necessary to keep continuity of the show. Just to, to tell the audience, this is what we're going to do. Oh, that's cool. You know, and we have that discussion. Before the blueprints, we always shot the blueprints last. Before that, before building even began, we would have meetings where me, Carrie, Tori, our camera crew, the sound people, all the producers and associate producers would all sit around a big table and talk about how we were going to do a myth. And that way, the camera crew says, oh, okay, we're going to need cameras to do this, this, and this. The sound guy says, okay, I'll need this special type of microphone. The producers say, okay, so what materials do you need? And we would work out how we were going to build something and how we were going to test it. So, and that all came from us. And I, I realize now that it's not a usual thing to have your hosts be able to build things and weld and cut, and so I acknowledge that, that that is a, it's a different concept, but it's true. We were able to do all that stuff, and we still do. So, thank you. Yes? 
Uh, so was M5 Industries a full functioning special effects company at the time while Miss Blasters was, was filming? It was not the first season. And in fact, I'll tell you this, during um, the first season, like Alcatraz Escape, I was there while they were filming that, w doing a side job for Jamie. So M5's bread and butter was toy prototypes, little puppets for commercials, and I would work for Jamie on the side. If I didn't have a project at ILM, he would hire me to, uh, well, uh, <laughs> can you come and uh, do a robot? I'm like, yeah. So I did, there was, um, there was a, a Tiger Woods tiger puppet, and so Tiger Woods would have his golf bag, and he had like a little cozy that was like a tiger, but it talked. So I worked on that puppet for, for Jamie. I also worked on the Pepsi Roomba that sucks, chases Dave Chappelle around an apartment and sucks his pants off. <laughs> so those, those were the type of things that we did at M5, and we did a bunch of toy prototypes too. So, in the first season of Mythbusters, they were still doing toy prototypes. It just became too much because Jamie is a very hands-on type of manager. Jamie, by the way, I'll tell you about Jamie as a manager. <laughs> Having worked, you, know, you can kind of see it on the show a little bit, but Jamie is a very frugal man. Um, <laughs> and, and when you work for Jamie... Jamie would buy the extra long screws, right? So he'd have all the different sizes of screws, but in extra long sizes. And so if I was making a toy prototype, I'd be like, Jamie, I need some, you know, uh, I need 5440 screws about half inch long. He's like, well, can't you cut down the, uh, the long ones? I'm like, but Jamie, there, <laughs> there's 20, I need 25 of these. Oh, all right, fine. <laughs> As a model maker, the number one thing that you use on a daily basis are exacto blades, right? Disposable blades for cutting things, marking things. It's, it's, it's a staple. Jamie would keep the spare exacto blades in his office, and you had to go and ask him <laughs> for another blade. Like, well, did you sharpen that one? You, you could get another use out of it if you. Yeah, yeah okay, okay, sure. I, I, I ended up bringing my own because I just didn't want to ask, you know, every time. So, but Jamie is a very hands-on manager and running projects while trying to host a show and build things for that show was just too much. So over time, it just became, he, he shut down, not, he didn't shut down M5, but he stopped taking on new work and occasionally would consult hmm. uh, in various projects like, um, one thing that I know that he did was with um, a university, and it's the, the camera that they use for sporting events, and it's got wires, and it flies all over the stadium. He worked on that. He consulted on that. He consulted on an electric motorcycle, all-electric motorcycle, and various pet projects over the years. He's also got a pair, I swear, this is the honest truth, he's got a pair of electric like shoe skates that he's been working on for about 10 years. It's like, and every time I see him, uh, have I shown you the uh, electric <laughs> shoe skate? I'm like, yeah, yeah, you showed me. Like, this is like the 12th time you've shown me. But this is a pet project that he is just, he's still working on it. So hopefully someday you'll see that. Since the end of Mythbusters, I'm pretty sure Jamie is totally ecstatic. The day after... Because this shop, M5, it was his actual shop, and that's what they, they filmed the whole show in. Ten years, oh, more, 12 years, they inhabited his shop. And so the day after they moved out, he's the happiest thing ever, because he finally has his shop back. Which really, also, having been to Jamie's house, I just, okay, I'll move on right after this. <laughs> If you could imagine, Jamie is, is the most Spartan guy ever. You wouldn't know it from M5, but his house, there are no wires anywhere. He, they really, he and his wife have it laid out so that you don't see any clutter anywhere. It's super, super minimal. And like, you know, his closet has 
white shirt, white shirt, white shirt, beret, 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 you know, for every day of the week. And, but really, that's just the place where he sleeps. Where he lives is his shop. And that is where everything is. And so when we go to, to um, surplus places on the weekend to look for robot parts, they would, you know, this pile of stuff would immediately come back and get, you know, put into various places in M5. So he's, he's very happy to have his home back after all these years. Yes? Hi, Grant. How are you? Good. So we have a little guy here who's a big fan. Hi. He's got a question for you. All right. What's your name? I'm Logan. Hi, Logan. <laughs> okay, what's your question? What's your question? Um, what's he bought on BattleBots? What, what, I... yeah, what do you have on BattleBots? And also, uh, what, would you, what good advice would you have for uh, young kids to get into robotics? Oh, okay. So about when I first competed in BattleBots in 1999, uh, I had a robot called Deadblow. It was, had a titanium arm, titanium armor, and it, it, would, uh, it had a hammer, and it would just peck on its opponents really, really hard, really fast. And after that, they asked me to write a book. I think it was 2003. So everything that I knew about the state of the art of combat robots, and specifically about fighting robots, I put into that book. Hopefully, it's still in print. It's been a while. Um, but everything that I know is in that book. If you, if you can find it, it will be a great introduction to, to robotics for kids. Nowadays, kids have mind storms. Like, when I was growing up, I didn't have mind storms. I couldn't program, put things together, and, and make motors turn. I just kind of had to take things apart and piece them together to make robots, but nowadays you can do all of these amazing things. There's uh, Mindstorms and a number of other kits that you can buy to get into robotics. As far as BattleBots goes, it is now on ABC. Uh, I was unable to, they asked me to be one of the judges in the first season I was, and second season. I was unable to because of uh, filming for, for the new show. So. And I can't really say if I will be in the third season um, at this point. I, for various reasons, I can't say. So hopefully I will be involved soon. So keep looking out for that. Yes. Hi. Um, I, I'm sorry. I'm really nervous. You're one of my heroes. Oh, thank you. Um, I really, really love robots, and uh, I was just wondering, what was some of your most favorite robotics projects to work on uh, within Mythbusters or without Mythbusters? Oh, R2-D2. <laughs> Besides R2-D2. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's hard to beat R2-D2 because I'm a child of the 70s. I was born in 1970. I was seven years old watching Star Wars, and it had a huge, huge impact on me. And it really established robots as friends, as heroes, and, and it was something that I knew that that was something that I wanted to be involved in someday. And fortunately, I was able to do that. When I was working at ILM in, let's see, it was prequels was 96, 97, something like that, I remember we started working on the prequels, and I remember Steve Golly, the supervisor, said, hey, 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 guy, what are, you, what are you doing on Monday? I'm like, I don't know. He goes, okay, you're going to work on R2-D2. You're going to do R2-D2. And, and it was really, I think, you know, if there, was, if there is such a thing as a nerdgasm, <laughs> that was what my heart felt at that moment. That's what I'm feeling right now, meeting you. Okay, good. That's, <laughs> so you understand. And really, you know, working on something that was such a big part of my childhood and getting to, what I did on R2 was take out all of the old, uh, probably Jedi era electronics and, and redo everything with modern power systems so that, because really, with the older electronics, R2 would run out of batteries and I don't know, maybe an hour. 
because in order to run R2's lights, there's a, they call it the, I think they call it the data display. It's kind of sparkly lights on the front and the back, uh, blue and white in the front and, and uh, red and green on the back. In order to do that effect, there actually was a wheel. There's a, a, a bundle of fiber optics that went to this wheel, one in front, one in back, and the wheels turned around and they had colored gels on them and they had a, an automotive light bulb, like a 12 volt automotive brake light in the middle there and that's what they used to do this effect. And you know, to get that brightness, it required a lot of current and run out of batteries. When you're filming with R2-D2, you never want to go, oh, oh sorry, sorry. He's, he's, I need to change his batteries. You want him ready to go at all times because to production, R2 is like a prop or, or a background piece, not, not like a, an actor, uh, although we know he's, you know, <laughs> really one of the stars of the show. Um, and so if you can find a way to make the battery last all day long and to never ever have to worry about it, that's, that's something worth doing. And so that was one of my jobs with R2 for the prequels. And, you know, being able to do that was uh, incredible. I can't, I can't say that how the feeling of, of working on an actual R2, and not only uh, in reality, uh, not just one, but 13 of them, the whole fleet was there at ILM. So um, that was absolutely a dream come true. Thank you so much. Thank you. I know that Mythbusters wasn't shot in the order that it was aired on television, so I was kind of curious about one thing. In some of the episodes, you, it was mentioned that you had a phobia of fish touching you. Yes. I was wondering, <laughs> did you get that phobia from filming the myth of like playing dead to avoid being attacked by sharks? Because that whole thing looked oh, like no. nothing but liquid nightmare fuel. I only have a few phobias. Uh, one of them is open water. Another one is fish touching me. Things touching me underwater. But which, by the way, how many people here do not like fish touching them underwater? See? There are people out there who have this exact same thing. Like that swishy feeling, you know, like with a goldfish or something like that touching you. It's the worst thing ever. Like that, that thing where they, they eat the dead skin off your feet. That is just the worst thing I could possibly... Imagine. That is, no, that is never, ever going to happen. And so, knowing these things, the producers had in mind this particular Shark Week episode. And honestly, we, we kind of knew, you know, I knew going in, okay, this is going to be, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay, I'm going to be in open water, there might be things touching me, I'm just going to go with it. The moment comes, and Carrie is taking big chunks of fish and chumming the water, and the water is just boiling with sharks because they're just in a frenzy. And the producer's like, okay, jump in. <laughs> and I was this close to saying, I, I, don't, I, you know, I don't really think, I don't need to do this. And, and you really, you never want to not participate in the thing. Because for one, you need this comparison for science. One guy thrashes, the other guy stays still, and then you switch. But two, it's just you, you know, they, they've set up all this thing, you, you're filming all this, this lead into this big event, you can't just in the middle of it say no. But in that moment, I was about to say no, and then Tori jumped right in, like, God, duh! So I ended up going through with it, and it was absolutely terrifying. And I, and I really, those people that say, you know, you need to face your fears, it'll help you overcome them, no, <laughs> it didn't, not at all. It did not help me. I am still terrified of things touching me underwater. So, yeah. It, it, and it was not because of that. As a result of that, I had that way before that happened. So... Uh, yeah, I, I probably won't be doing anything like that anytime soon. I feel so sorry for you. <laughs> Thank you. So 
do you have any myths or concepts that you really wanted to do, but just didn't have the time, money, oh, or team to the actually one, ever accomplish? You know, I, I think for us, there was a short list of maybe four, maybe five myths that we had always wanted to do, but were unable to do for various reasons. The number one for me is called upside down race car. And theoretically, a Formula One race car, uh, they have their design with their aerodynamics to force the car down on the track. The more downforce you have, the better the traction and the more of your horsepower you can convert to the road. Also, it helps uh, with bank turns and things like that. Theoretically, there is so much downforce because of the aerodynamics that the car could run inverted. Unfortunately, in order to test this, we would need a Formula One race car, a, a helical track, or a super, super long tunnel, and somebody dumb enough to drive it. <laughs> now, Tori already, Tori already volunteered for number three, so that's not enough to get it done. Um, so we were never able to test that one, but that would have been awesome. I know Top Gear did kind of a, a thing with a, you know, it wasn't a Formula One car. Uh, they did have a tunnel, and I think they managed to, to loop the car, but this one, that one was one of the ones since day one for more than 10 years. And when we began the show, we were each given um, like a, a, show, a show Bible. And it had every myth, it was, it was like a collection of every myth that they could find up to that point in time. And it was thick. It was 60 pages long, like a full, you know, a, a full guide. And that was on there has, had been on there ever since the beginning, and we just never found a way. I mean, we got close a couple times. A couple people were like, okay, you know, you can, you can borrow our other race car, and it was just the insurance people never, ever, and, and yes, we had insurance on our show. <laughs> there was somebody crazy enough to give Mythbusters an insurance policy. They're the same people who insured jackass. <laughs> so, I mean, compared to them, we were the safe ones. But still, it all came down to the insurance people saying, no, I, I, it's just too, we couldn't get the location, we couldn't, they wouldn't say yes to it, because, you know, I mean, what, fiery wreck involving, you know, one of our hosts, probably not a good idea. So, unfortunately, we were never able to do that one. So, too bad. Thank you. Thank you. I actually have have a question that does not um, relate to MythBusters. It's actually related to Star Trek. Okay. So, one, how did um, the audition go, and how did you get the role? And also, <laughs> can you tell us about any future episodes? Yes. So I was am involved in a Star Trek web series called Star Trek Continues. And Which it's, is still running, by the way. It is still running. It is still running. It's set in the original series universe, and I play Sulu. The audition, yeah, I know. It's, it's, I, I will tell you in a second how amazing that is. I had met Vic Mignogna, who is the creator, executive producer, and also who plays Kirk on our show. At, I met him at Dragon Con probably three or four years before... Star Trek Continues actually got off the ground. So we'd known each other. We happened to be at a friend's party, a mutual friend's party, and he started showing me pictures of the bridge. He's like, oh, hey, do you like Star Trek? I'm like, yeah. He's like, oh, yeah, I'm working on this project, and um, yeah, it's going to be cool. Yeah, you know, we're, we're recreating the original series of Star Trek. And he's showing me, he's got, here, let me show you a couple pictures. He whips out his phone, and he's showing me pictures of the bridge, and you can see the drool forming <laughs> as I'm like, wow, that is super cool. I, that's amazing, Vic. I, I can't believe that. And he's like, yeah, you know. And I was like, 
you know, if you ever need any help with that, I would be happy, you know, in any way, because I have a background in, in prop making and special effects and engineering, and it's like, yeah, if you ever need any help or anything, I would love to see the set. That would be super cool. It's like, okay, cool. Two days later, <laughs> Vic calls me, and he goes, um, you know, Grant, I, I know that you're comfortable in front of the camera, and, you know, you're, you're a solid guy, and, and you have this whole fan base built in. Would you be my Sulu? <laughs> like, yeah. Yes, I will. <laughs> and, and we had this discussion early on about how to play the character and, and what would be the tone of our show. And he's like, look, over the years, there have been so many caricatures of Kirk. It would be easy to fall into that. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> He's like, I don't want to do that. I want to make sure that we stay true to these characters. And if I ever get to, you know, Kirky, you should, you, know, you and anyone else in the crew should say something and we'll refilm it. And he said, how you play Sulu is up to you. And so I had this choice. I was like, should I, you know, do like John Cho did on, in, the, uh, in the reboot and just use my regular voice or should I go for the George George's original voice. I'm like, what would be more true to that character? And so I decided, you know what? Actually, I think I should try and, and be Sulu as Sulu existed in that era. And as part of Sulu existing in that era, he sounds a certain way. And so I, in front of a mirror, just continued to practice and practice, like lowering my register, lowering my register, Lowering my register, getting closer, <laughs> oh my. <laughs> so. And it is one of the great joys of my life to be able to go onto that set. I remember the first time we filmed, filmed these uh, vignettes, just little short preview clips, little self-contained five-minute stories. I could not stop smiling because our, our bridge set is incredible. It's and like the, it's exact replica. It is, it is as close as you can get ba based on the original plans and the rest of our sets are laid out in the exact same configuration as they had back in the day. And we've got the curved hallway so as you walk through the hallway of the Enterprise, you can't see off the end. You're, in my mind, I am walking on the Enterprise. And every time we go back for filming, I just, I, I cannot stop smiling. It's, it now feels like home. We are continuing episodes. We're filming three more episodes uh, because that was part of our Kickstarter, which we completed already completed, so those are on the way. We're gonna be filming those soon, and you'll be able to see those. After that, unfortunately, uh, there won't be any more. But in reality, we were only gonna do 13 episodes. We we're only ever gonna do 13, just to complete that final, final voyage. The cool thing is that Vic is committed to the finale episode being the thing that launches us into the movies, the, the motion pictures. And so there's, there's finally going to be that link for, for fans. So we, we will have that closure. They're working on that script right now. And that's the very last one. The other two scripts are pretty much done. And we're going to be filming those soon. Did you have a favorite episode? Oh, it's tough. You know, I, I think... I think the Mirror Universe episode. Yes, it's my favorite. Yeah. And, and it was like, for us, it was cool to return to the Mirror Universe. And, and Vic is a stickler for detail. And, and if you watch Star Trek Continues, you can see that in every frame that appears on screen. It's not only the sets and the costumes and the music and the cinematography. It's also the scripts and how... And, and really, that's the most difficult thing to get right because we want to 
honor Gene Roddenberry and, uh, and address the types of issues that he was trying to do back during the original series. And so uh, one of the fun things we were able to do is go back to the mirror universe and have that and, and live in there for a little bit. And it was really neat to be able to do that. I also liked how the first few minutes of it was an exact shot for shot redo yeah. of the end of the episode. Yeah. And 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 uh, someone published a side by side and we were we were working on that specifically on set, comparing the angles just to make sure that we had that transition, that we were able to to do that and, and honor the original series. Thank you very much. Thank you. Trek continues. Star Trek continues on YouTube and Vimeo. We're on episode uh, I think we're filming eight and nine soon. Yes. Uh, do you collect anything? Do I collect anything? I, let's see, what do I collect? I've been trying not to collect things for a while because I had, up until about five years ago, I had all of my original Star Wars figures, my, my Kenner action figures, I had my Hasbro G.I. Joe figures, I had the Sky Striker, I had uh, you know, the Dragonfly helicopter, I had everything. And it was taking up so much space, so much space. And so I'm like, you know what, these things, they gave me great joy once, and I would like to be able to give someone else great joy. So I, I ended up selling those on eBay to two people. Since then, I haven't really been collecting much. I, I have little prop things, like in my, my I, have, I allow myself to have a shelf. The shelf has uh, a Warehouse 13 Tesla gun, a high-end replica. I have, oh, I, I love the, uh, the Wand Company Star Trek replica stuff. The funny thing about the Wand Company is that they wanted to make really super high-end replica props, but they didn't have the license to do a phaser and a communicator. They had the license to do TV remotes, and so they made the most accurate phaser replica, which also happens to be a gesture-based TV remote. <laughs> This thing is so good, by the way. If you ever have the chance to get your hands on one of these, it feels so good. And on Star Trek Continues, our hero props, I was like, where did you get this thing? And it has, you know, um, the handle comes off, and that's your battery pack. There's a, a mini phaser that pops off the top. It does the sound. It is gorgeous. I'm like, where did you get these? They're like, uh, Think Geek. I ordered one that afternoon. And the Bluetooth, and then they have this other thing, a, a Bluetooth communicator. Flip up, connects to your phone. Oh. Yeah. I mean, when that thing came out, when I heard about it, I was like, I have to get one of these. Um, it's amazing. It, is, it was so fun. So I have those two things. I have a Commissioner Gordon badge. Um, what else do I have? Uh, <laughs> a couple other sort of high-end replica things. Uh, here's what I do collect, actually, are are high-end replica costumes. So I have some uh, company named Novos does high-end, yeah, there you go, see. They do super high-end replica costumes, and if you want the most accurate Star Trek, Battlestar Galactica, um, Star Wars costumes, they have them. And so I have, the, my favorite costume ever is the Wrath of Khan era Star Trek uniform. The, they call them Monster Maroons is the nickname. But th this thing is so awesome. And I find that they are happiness makers. <laughs> I put this thing on and I'm instantly so much happier. I have uh, Star Trek Monster Maroon, Battlestar Galactica uh, Duty Blues, Officer Duty Blues. I have a Viper Pilot, which I had made for me. It's going to sound creepy. A guy in Ohio made it in his basement. But it's really, really good. It's super cool. Uh, and uh, uh, Doctor Who, I have a David Tennant uh, suit, a Magnoli suit. So I, I would say if, if there's anything that I collect these days, it's like props and costumes. 
They don't take up quite as much space as entire collections of action figures, but I still get, you know, great enjoyment out of them. Yes? Um, I was sort of confused about one thing. When you were testing myths about mythical cures for a spicy mouth, yeah. um, it seemed like it, the show kind of went to the weirder stuff a little too quickly, like toothpaste and petroleum jelly and wasabi and whatnot, and it seemed like it missed one of the more, like, when I was growing up, I was always told that if you, have, if you eat something spicy, the best thing to do for that would be to have ice cream because yeah. it's cold and it's a dairy-based product, and you tested milk as a base. So I'm wondering, why yeah. wasn't that one tasty? Dairy. Dairy, I think, was the obvious choice, and that's something that they knew would, would absolutely work. Part of the show evolved into entertainment value for torturing us <laughs> as human guinea pigs, and you could see this, I think it was, it was really the seasickness episode, seasickness cures, where they go, wow, making them suffer is comedy gold. <laughs> so let's make them eat really spicy things and then test. And, and I, as we were having our meeting about what we were going to use to cure spiciness, I'm like, really? Petroleum jelly? <laughs> Wasabi? You're, you're kidding me with these things. And they're like, look, this is what the internet says, and you're going to test it. <laughs> and yeah, I'm like, what about the, the obvious choice? Yogurt, milk, dairy. And they're like, yeah, that's the obvious choice. And we know it's probably going to work, so it's not going to be that fun. So yeah, the, the spicy things are the, I mean, those, those weird cures are, are what they wanted to try. And also, with the seasickness cures, it wasn't like Dramamine, which you know is gonna work. It's uh, you know the, the pressure point thing and the little watch thing that shocks you, uh, which I, I still don't know how that one is supposed to work, but it's, it shocks you, and then there's ginger tablets, which actually kind of did work. But it was always about the thing that is, is not the obvious choice. That's what they use to, to test that. And because of the whole, like, it's comedy gold to watch you suffer, that's why they didn't have Carrie do, get, getting tested and, uh, um, and Tori, and they, they chose you instead because you don't like spicy foods. Oh, yeah. No, we all, I think we all did our fair share of eating the spicy food. And I think it was me and Tori in some kind of weird, I, I remember like a, a spicy showdown trying these different things. It's funny how it always seemed to be me and Tori testing things, and Carrie would stand off to the side and, and administer the test. Yeah, I was wondering why they didn't vary it up and have her in the test and have you administer sometimes. I, I don't know, but funny how that worked out, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Grant. Um, I, you kind of like segued perfect into my... So one of my very favorite episodes is you in the tight pants. So <laughs> oh yeah, this is the shrink to fit jeans, cutting off your circulation. How how really uncomfortable was that episode for you? In reality, it wasn't that uncomfortable. It was and and it, it was pretty good actually. I got to sit in kind of like a warm pool most of the day. Um, the pants were a little tight and they did stretch a bit. Uh, but it wasn't that bad. It wasn't, you know, what you imagine with that is that they are slowly squeezing you to death <laughs> and everything is getting squeezed out and, and cutting off your circulation. But in, in reality, it was actually pretty, pretty okay. It wasn't, it wasn't like I was in pain, like some of these myths. Uh, there was definite pain involved in some of them. That one on a scale of one to 10, probably about a two or three, as opposed to seasickness, which is like 11, <laughs> or spiders on your head, which is like infinity. Um, okay, I have time for one more. One more, no more. Two more questions, okay, yes. Hi Grant, first off I want to say my favorite build that you did was the Wacha. Oh yeah, Wacha. My the, question is, what was the hardest build you guys ever did on the show? And also, were you able to keep any pieces of Buster after the series ended? Yes. <laughs> I will answer the second part first. So, 
we were gifted by Adam after the finale episode with a, a tiny box. Um, and and I, I have to say, watching the finale episode, I have mixed feelings because, um, not because of the finale, but because they blew up Buster. And, um, you know, it's like, it's kind of like, I know Buster is technically an inanimate object, <laughs> but for 10 years, it was like, you know, he was part of our family, and then they blew him up. <laughs> so I felt I actually, I had a, 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 an emotional reaction to that watching the finale, but after that, Adam gifted us each with uh, a little plastic box that had a piece of Buster. So up on my shelf, I have a little bit of Buster that, that I, I uh, carry with me to this day. One of the hardest builds that we did, just because of sheer size, was playing tennis on the wing of an airplane. And it was, they wouldn't let us, the myth is about uh, two tennis pros, one on either tip of a wing, playing tennis back and forth while the airplane's in flight. Discovery wouldn't let us in any way fly on any airplane. Even though people walk on the wings, they wouldn't let us do it. So we had to build one of our own. And we took a flatbed truck, built up a giant wing structure on top of that, and Tori and I stood on either side trying to play tennis. Um, and it was incredibly difficult because of the scale of the amount of steel that you have to build to make it safe for two people to stand on that. And we drove up and down the runway. And as a matter of fact, you can play tennis on the wing of an airplane. You can volley if you, if you go into the wind. It'll go back and forth. So. Okay, last question. Thank you. Um, I'm kind of veering off a little bit from Mythbusters. Um, okay. I read that you had actually considered changing your degree to screenwriting if yes. you hadn't gone with electrical engineering. Yes. And my degree's in math, and I kind of want to think, do you still, and I want to be a screenwriter, even though all I do is math all day, but I was wondering if you still kind of have that dream still. Actually, no, and here's why. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you this uh, in closing. I did... I quit engineering in my uh, junior year. I quit electrical engineering, and I was like, I want to do something creative with my life. So, like screenwriting. So I went to the cinema school, and I said, hey, can I sit down on one of your classes? They said, no. Because, you know, people actually apply to the cinema school, and it's very exclusive at USC. But they said, given your background, why don't you go down and talk to Tom Holman? He invented the THX sound system. He's an engineer and he works in the movie industry. So I became his um, assistant, and he would take me to meetings, give me things to read, and eventually I returned to engineering. And what I found was that there was a way for me, because I envisioned my life as an engineer, sitting in a cubicle, calculating you know, the, the current flow through this circuit like 100 times a day, every day. I found a way through working with Tom that I could be involved in something intensely creative but still be an engineer. And after I got my degree, I graduated, I went to work for Tom at THX. And that's what started my whole career in the entertainment industry. Out, right out of college, I was blowing up loudspeakers and amplifiers on purpose <laughs> for the THX sound system. And then eventually, Friends of mine said, hey, we need some help in special effects. You're an engineer. Uh, you, you know about robotics and radio control. Can you come help us? So what I was missing while I was studying engineering was that creative outlet, like screenwriting. What I found in the end was a way to still be able to do, an en do my engineering work because I, I love what we did on Mythbusters was solving problems, essentially, which is what engineers do every day. But being able to combine that with something in the entertainment industry. So what I have to say to you is, do if math is what makes you happy, I would continue doing that. And in this day and age, you can also be a screenwriter. You can also, because believe me, in Los Angeles, Everybody's working on a script. <laughs>
<laughs> it's something that you can do in your spare time. And then when you have a script, if you want to transition over, you'll be able to do that too. Cool. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks a lot, you guys. I'll be taking pictures and signing autographs this afternoon. Come say hi. <laughs>